would uh, have a great morning with us. Please stand. Let's start with some prayer together. Father, thank you so much for bringing us to this place, giving us an opportunity to spend some time together. Fill this place, fill our hearts with who you are. Settle us in your presence. We pray that this would be a, a time when we praise you. We remember our place in your plan and in this place. And in your name we pray. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory.
What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen.
longer. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Hey, Amen. Welcome to worship. Welcome to uh, worship at Road to Emmaus Presbyterian Church. It is good to have this safe place for us all to come and gather on a Sunday. Won't you join me in the call to worship this morning? It's found on the board and in your bulletins. <clears throat> God, our refuge and strength, an everlasting present help in trouble. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of There is no distinction, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No matter how close is our relationship with God, we always fall short of God's standard of behavior and attitude. We fail, we fail the one who gave us life. Confession removes our attempts to cover up our failure and qualifies us to receive the forgiving grace God grants. Please stand and join me in the prayer of confession. We admit, O oh God, that we have seldom claimed the power of the gospel. Rather, we have been ashamed to speak the good news in various settings of our lives. We join ourselves to the earth's corruption rather than risking to speak your name. We battle one another rather than daring to be a witness to peace and grace. We give little thought to your laws and fail to teach them to our children. False pride keeps us from complete trust in you. Help us find release from the limits we place on ourselves. Amen. In our fear of humiliation, God is our protection. God is a shelter and refuge, a very present help in trouble. We need not fear the changes all around us, for God is in the midst of them all. We are in covenant with one whose grace is sufficient for all of our needs. Jesus Christ draws us into oneness with God. We are justified by faith and restored again. Please join in the song if we are honest.
Please be seated. God of law and grace, you shared our common lot in Jesus Christ. We are drawn to your righteousness, believing by your word that will justify us and lead us to wholeness. You are freeing us. May that freedom be attractive to others who need the good news of the gospel. Unite us in love for you and one another, that your might find a, that your will might find us in, might find life in us and in all that we meet. Amen. Amen. Sorry about that. Today's scripture reading is going to be found on page eight sixty three in the Pew Bibles. It's from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it's chapter six, verses forty six through forty nine about building our house on a rock. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hear my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house, who dug, a deep, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it, because it had been built well. But the one who hears and does not the one who hears and does not do them is like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's greet one another in the name of Jesus as the kids come in for the children's message. everybody. I'm back from vacation, so I'm all rested and I'm ready to get going with the children's messages again. <laughs> Let's wave to the people at home. <laughs> so I have, I like to have messages. God leads me to messages where you are involved in part of the story. Or So today I've it's something we haven't done for a while. I brought bags, and everybody gets a chance to open a bag and hold it up to the congregation and the people at home. So here, Julia, we open bag number one. You can go ahead and open it now. What is it? Hold it. Yeah. A pencil, right. Do you have a pencil like that at school? A yellow pencil? Not yet. <laughs> Your sister probably does. Do you still get yellow pencils at school? Zach and Olivia. And yeah, thank you. Put this here. And now we have the second one. Here we'll let Maria open that. We'll just go around in a circle. I have six bags. That was the plan. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little pencil. One that's been well used. But it's amazing the eraser's still there, because I always use the eraser before anything else. I make lots of mistakes. <laughs> so Zach gets the big bag. <laughs> oh, rights too. Yep, but rights too. You, you could. Yeah. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, this is an old props. <laughs> All right, Olivia. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, it is poking through the bag. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice, fancy, sparkly pencil. Something I would want to write with or draw with. And here, Adrian. Bag number five. And stand that up. That's called a mechanical pencil. Oh, yeah. It has a real fine point. It doesn't, instead of being sharpened, there's a hollow core on the inside that you put the graphite. Artists like to use this because they can make a really fine, skinny line that you can't do with a bigger pencil. And here's the last one. Do you know what kind of pencil that is? Yeah. It's a, called a yeah, carpenter's pencil. You're right. It's so it doesn't roll off off the workbench with the power saw. <laughs> yeah. Stick behind the ear. Yes. Yeah. So there's no eraser though, so it's <laughs> you can't make mistakes, right? Yeah, sand it up. So even though all these pencils look different, they all have things in common, just like each one of you here. We all look different on the outside, but we all have things on common in the inside. All these pencils, it doesn't matter how they look, whether they're yellow or big or small, they all have uh, black graphite, and that's what you use to make the mark on paper or wood. Even a regular regular pencil will mark wood. It just will, might roll off the workbench. <laughs> and so that's kind of like our lives. Like I said, God doesn't care what we look like on the outside. It's what on, is on the inside that matters to him. And there's another thing that our lives are kind of like pencils. A pencil can't do anything on its own. I couldn't go home or Maria couldn't go home and pick up the fancy pencil and say, okay, do my math homework. Is that going to happen? <laughs> you wish, but it's not going to happen. You have to hold it. It needs a hand to guide it to make the mark. And God loves us, and he knows what's best for us. So he wants to, he would like us to be, allow him to be the guide for hand to guide our hand, lives by what we do, by what we say, by our actions. He loves us so much, he sent his son to the earth. And when we allow God to control our lives, our actions are like making marks that shows God's love to other people. So since we have Cindy up here, you can get open the last bag. Oh, wow. I did bring seven in case Jaden was here. You can hold. Yes, yeah, so everyone will get a shiny pencil today after, ch after church. <laughs> but let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent your son. Help us, allow us to let your love guide our actions so that we can leave marks to show other people your love. And all God's children said, Amen. Seeing no further hands, let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you now uh, gladly, humbly, thankfully, in that you are a Father who hears the concerns of his children. We ask, Lord, today that as we come before the throne of grace uh, and acknowledge your power and sovereignty in the world, we conform our wills to yours. And we bring these things, Lord, because these are the things of our concern, and we ask that your glorious will would be done in each and every situation. We uh, even now surrender our understanding and our wants to give them to you in prayer. And so, Lord, uh, you call us to pray anyway, uh, asking. Uh, so we do humbly ask for healing in the lives of so many people that we love and that uh, we trust you to do your uh, good thing in their lives. Today, we pray for, uh, for Pat and Joe Parton, uh, relatives in Alabama of mine, of my family, 
We ask, Lord, that you would watch over them as they uh, navigate um, their time with COVID. Just heal them, Lord, we pray. We pray for a Steve uh, who now has this diagnosis of bladder cancer. I thank you, Lord, for John's concern for his brother-in-law. I ask, Lord, that you would be at work uh, in the the wisdom and uh, specialty of doctors. Um, but Lord, even above and beyond that, we pray, Lord, for your miraculous healing in his life. We pray for David as he battles COVID. We pray for Vanessa and her family as they battle COVID. We thank you, Lord, for Barry's friend, Zach, and ask, Lord, that you would continue to heal him, uh, even through this most recent surgery. Just ask, Lord, that uh, you would bring him to full health uh, once again, and, uh, and that he would give thanks for all the healing uh, that comes only from you. We, Lord, pray for Marcia's family as they've had this uh, loss of uh, Sister Mindy. Just ask, Lord, that in the midst of that loss, that you would heal that empty spot in their hearts, that you would fill it with your very presence. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that Marcia was a person of faith and know, knew well uh, and knows fully now of the victorious life of, of, of your heaven. We pray, Lord, for Jim, Laura's dad, as he's having a, an amendment done to uh, his, uh, his, his leg uh, that's been amputated and that he would uh, be able to soon again be able to use his prosthetic leg. We pray, Lord, for Barbara and Joseph Navarro this day. And ask, Lord, that you would be at work in their lives for healing, especially for Barbara today, uh, and that you would bring together divine appointments that as they meet people that you're calling them to minister to, that uh, there would be good connections, good invitations, good response, and that, uh, that there would be a whole new work of ministry among Spanish-speaking people here in the Harrisburg area. So, Lord, in a moment of quiet, we just lift up to you the concerns that weigh us down. We release them to your care now. We breathe deeply of your spirit this day. Thank you, Lord, for your presence and your sovereign care. We thank you for the offering that is being collected through the online tool, through the offering box, those things that are being uh, mailed in. We ask, Lord, today that the generosity of these people would be well suited for the ministry that you call us to. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. If you'd please stand with me now. We're going to say together our affirmation of faith. This is uh, what we have been using in Lent over the last couple of years. And so... Let's say these words together. God declared that the world he created was good and that human beings made in his own image were very good. The present disordered state of the world in which we and all things are subject to misery and to evil is not God's doing, but is a, re a result of humanity's free sinful rebellion against God's will. As a result of sin, Human life is poisoned by everlasting death. No part of human life is untouched by sin. Our desires are no longer trustworthy guides to goodness, and what seems natural to us no longer corresponds to God's design. We are not merely wounded in our sin. We are dead, unable to save ourselves. Apart from God's initiative, Salvation is not possible for us. Our only hope is God's grace. And we discover in scripture that this is a great hope for our God is the one whose mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, please be seated. That particular confession is almost too hard to get through the middle of until we get to the great glorious end, isn't it? Isn't it? But it's uh, so good for us to, to recognize what's inside, particularly in this season of Lent. We come now to our time of communion uh, here in Lent. Um, and for the weeks after Easter, we have this uh, differently ordered um, time of worship. And so we, that brings us now to the Lord's Supper. And so as we prepare to come before the table of the Lord, 
Uh, hear these words. Follow along, please, on the screens. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and come to sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when his disciples were at table with him, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And as they received it, their eyes were open, and they recognized him. Friends, this is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all those who trust in him as Lord and Savior to trust, share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's bow in prayer. Lord God, it is right to give our thanks and praise to you. You are our greatest joy, eternal God, our creator. You have given us life and second birth in your spirit. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. You claimed Israel as your chosen nation. You have raised up the church as a witness to the resurrection. You have breathed into it your life and power. And from worlds apart, you gather us together. And when we go astray, you welcome us home. Always, always, your love is steadfast. Therefore, we praise you. We join our voices with the choirs of heaven, who, with all the faithful at every time and place, forever sing to the glory of your name. Together we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty. Blessed is Jesus Christ, who is your Son and our Lord. In love with you and in compassion for all, Jesus healed and taught. He challenged and comforted. He welcomed and saved. He formed a community, promising to be with his disciples wherever two or three are gathered, and sending them on his mission of hope and healing in the world. Jesus trusted his life to you. He went freely to his death so that the world might be set free from suffering and sin. And God, Father, you raised him from death. You raise us also to new life in him. And so in the power of the Holy Spirit, you send us out to make disciples as he commanded. And remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you have given us, and we celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Together we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with all those living in Christ, with all who are baptized in your name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. And as this bread has been Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Oh God, today you call us to be your disciples. You have called us together to be the church. Unite us now at your table in this one loaf and a common cup. Make us one in Christ Jesus. Let your spirit empower the life we share to ignite our witness in the world. And with all who have gone before us, keep us faithful to the gospel teachings. Keep us faithful to fellowship. Keep us faithful to prayer. Give us strength to serve you until that promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. And so through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. As Christ, our Savior, taught us to pray, we are bold to pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, 
He took bread and he broke it, giving it to his friends, saying, Friends, take and eat. This is my body. It is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, a covenant that is sealed in my blood, blood that is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And so each time we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again in glory. Yes, please. Um, Don't let this confuse you. Uh, Welcome back uh, to another week of worship in the season of Lent. We are continuing our uh, work together in um, a study of what it means to be a man. Uh, But let's just remember what Lent in general is about. Lent is a season of honest internal investigation of ourselves. And we have to see what's there, and we have to admit the sin that is also there. Um, I do also remember that it's a time to reflect not only on the sin, but the need of that sin to be um, rectified. And uh, Lent calls us to accept Jesus' salvation that's given to us freely in his perfect life, his sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection. So now let's think about our actions. What is our response to this? How well are we living a godly life in light of these things and in light of God's law? It's time to renew our efforts to live out the spiritual disciplines, and also God's law reminds us, shows us our sin, leads us to confession, and so that we might rightly know God's amazing grace. So thank you for coming to worship today. This Lent, we are borrowing uh, from a book called The Men We Need by Brant Hansen, an excellent book I recommend to you, Uh, and he offers, offers a helpful frame in which to uh, put our discussion and discovery regarding what and who God makes men to be. Now, um, uh, Brandt organizes his book around six decisions. It's a nice organization, and um, these decisions are the ones men must make in order to be the men uh, God has created them to be. And Wayne and I are doing this together because there are things here that uh, women we need to take also into our own lives, things that we can do better, and also things that we can encourage the men in our lives uh, to do and in order to grow in godly character. So uh, just as a quick review, uh, our first week, two weeks ago, we reminded, remi- reminded? Yeah, we reminded ourselves um, that God made us, and he made us for relationship with him, with each other, and for relationship with creation itself. And in the Garden of Eden, all of these relationships were perfect and transparent. Uh, God also made people in his image. Uh, We have eternal spirit within us. We have an intellectual capacity for love, logic, creativity, and appreciation for beauty. And being made in God's image, um, uh, God's image is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That means we're also made in community for community. Uh, That also means being one while also having a variety of differences. We see this in the way God creates us uh, as being male and female and with diverse temperaments and abilities being complementary yet at the same time all made good for his purposes. And these realities are deep, immutable, and really ultimately undeniable. Um, Sometimes we think though we can make our own realities and uh, this is uh, pretending to be something that we're not. This is a lie that began back in the Garden of Eden and uh, the Satan was in his talking serpent disguise Um, and he dupes Adam and Eve into thinking that they could be good for themselves, that they could be gods for themselves and uh, that's a lie. The realities that humans make will always be fake or Today we call it virtual reality. Um, And the virtual world of our own making is often easier than the real one, Um, but it's because it's fake, it will never really bring meaning. It's full of meaninglessness. So there's only one reality, the one where we embrace who we're made to be in God's image and for the work he designs in the garden. Um, And we are called, uh, especially this is about our men, so let's think about you guys. Men are called to relish the real, forsake the fake, and live the life God has given to you. Um, In our second week, we um, talked a little bit about protecting the vulnerable as one of the decisions that um, God has men make. It means being 100% present in our relationships with God, people, and creation. It means using your position as a godly man for positive impact and change rather than aggression on one hand or 
being completely passive on the other, both of which really result in spiritual death. It means recognizing who are the vulnerable in your garden and um, by uh, protecting them, providing for them, encouraging them by modeling Jesus in your own attitudes and behaviors. And all of this is dependent on the most important priority. This is for men and for women, of course, that Jesus Christ is our first priority, our first uh, action in our life. The power of the Holy Spirit will then allow men to be all that they have created to be. Same thing for us ladies. We'll talk more about that, ladies, after Easter. So this week we're going to talk about the decision to be ambitious about the right things. You want to do that? Great. Okay. She gets the clicker. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. There's this unyielding truth out there, right? This unyielding truth. Our opinions and our wants don't change reality as much as we'd like them to. Now, where can we see this? There's a couple of obvious places. One of those places is in math, right? And so if you take uh, two indivisible and unyielding things, and we'll count those two things as my finger because I'm not willing to chop them up and make them into more than one finger. If we take two and add them to two, what do we get? We get four. Two plus two equals four in every single case. The physical world is such that there's this thing called gravity, right? We have a uh, uh, larger masses have larger gravity than smaller masses, and so things of smaller mass are attracted to things of a bigger mass. And so deciding, for example, just on my own whim, that 2 plus 2 does not equal 4 anymore and that gravity does not exist doesn't change those realities, right? So I'd like maybe just to take a little sidebar here and think about the way we use science these days. You've heard it said quite a lot the science says. And so that means that we must believe whatever that person is saying by prefacing their opinion when they say the science says. The science says. It's a mistaken, by the way, use of the word science. Science is not the truth itself. Science is the process of human understanding about the actual truth of the physical universe. And there's a million examples of this where the science got it wrong and then it kind of figured it out over time to really begin to understand the physical underpinnings, the physical truths that are sometimes, uh, that, that are, are actually in uh, the world. Now, science is always a rough draft of the process of refining uh, the human understanding of this actual physical truth. And it turns out that science can only uncover a particular kind of truth. It cannot under, un, uncover the truth of history, nor can it uncover the truth about relationships. There's no way I can prove by scientific means that Rebecca loves me. I have to trust her on that truth and what she says is the truth about me. Now, Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God is the deepest reality. It is the most foundational truth. The kingdom of God is the most foundational truth that is out there. If you think about that in comparison to the physical world, the physical world that we inhabit is finite. It had a beginning, and it will have an end. It has a timeline. On the other hand, the kingdom of God is eternal. It, does, it, is, it is beyond time. Its king, the kingdom of God king, is the author of the physical laws that rule this universe, or at least its physical stuff. The kingdom of God exists outside of time. If we think about the kingdom of God as a whole, the, the universe, the cosmos, the physical stuff that we think about, it's really just a speck in, in that God has given room for to exist in time. Now, if we think about human powers, historical power, all human powers tied to people like presidents and monarchs and dictators and their militaries. But the kingdom of God, which doesn't indeed include the universe, the cosmos, the kingdom of God is ruled by the sovereign will of the king of kings, the one true king. And so as we listen to Jesus talk about the kingdom of God, we realize that it is more real than anything else. When uh, physicists try to probe the atoms that make up this lectern, you know, they look inside, they peer deep inside with these uh, fancy electron microscopes, and they, they discover what's going on in subatomic particles. One of the most surprising things that they discover is that what is actually there is mostly empty space. 
There are these little little particles whizzing around, but they are so small compared to the larger size of the atom. So it begs the question, so what's really real? What makes up reality? What makes up the physical stuff of the, of the real world? I think the Lord's Prayer actually speaks to this in this way. When we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in, in heaven, we discover that this is just a, a fraction of the real real. The kingdom of God real. And we're praying that this reality that we're in now will be aligned more and more and more until it is one day fully what it is made to be, the kingdom of heaven. And so when we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it, it indicates to us that reality starts not in the atom, but in the kingdom. That is our starting place. So it's the kingdom of God where we are called to build the houses of our lives. And we heard Kirk read these passages from us today, just a quick review. Jesus teaches that when we are ambitious for the things of our own virtual worlds, when we make our own house, we decide where it ought to be. What happens? Well, the winds come, the storms rise, the stream broke against it, and it falls. And yeah, maybe that house had a great ocean view, but it is vulnerable to the wind and the waves. And things get hard when the storm comes and our house crumbles. Jesus teaches likewise that when we build our houses, uh, the house of our lives in the kingdom of God, that's like building on a firm stone foundation. It is the most real, real thing that exists. It is the strongest foundation on which we can build our house. The streams broke against that house and it could not shake it because it had been well built. Now, a person might ask, how do I know if I'm building my house on the sand, on this shifting sand of virtual reality, of the things of my own choosing, the things of my own making? Well, when we are being ambitious about the wrong things, it might be awesome for a while. We might have great ocean view, right? But it never lasts long. When our ambitions are about the wrong things, we will be hit, you know, good and hard by reality. <laughs> That's when we will know we've been ambitious about the wrong things when reality smacks us in the face. The key to avoiding a face full of closed door is to ask for wisdom. And, and Proverbs is a good place to think about that. Here in Proverbs 2, just a couple of verses, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is the shield to those who walk in integrity. So you get the picture there. We have to be careful, though, not to mistake wisdom for what we colloquially call book knowledge, right? We often assume that wisdom is meant about having this soaring intellect and all of this smarts, uh, that it's reserved for those with PhDs and with their names on books and that sort of a thing. Wisdom, instead, is an intensely practical thing, practical in this way. Wisdom knows uh, what matters and what doesn't. Wisdom knows what to be ambitious about and what not to be ambitious about. When we are wise, we celebrate God's blessing in our lives, and we share that blessing with others to bless them as well. And so wisdom is the art of living a meaningful, significant life uh, whose ambitions are in alignment with the flow of God's truth, his will, and his grace. And so ambition starts with being, uh, with having, uh, what does it say? Being ambitious is about, I think I missed, yeah, that's it right up there. <laughs> All right, so if that's true, which we know it is, um, let's think about how wisdom fits in with this ambition. Um, what do we know? Men are made to be productive workers in the garden. They're meant to be keepers of the garden, and when a man invests his life in meaningless things, his garden does not flourish. In fact, it becomes a meaningless, his life becomes filled with meaninglessness. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that it's not okay to just step away and have a little, you know, fun time. I mean, even God rested one day during the week, right? So there is room in God's plan for pursuing things that are just for enjoyment. Um, but it can be easy to fall into those a little too much. Uh, 
you know, how much TV can you really watch? How many video games should you really be watching? And as a red flag, if you're beginning to now identify yourself as someone who's like, uh, I'm, I belong to the gaming community, like my identity is to be part of the gaming community, be careful, you might be going down this road. Um, the French call this overwhelming <coughs> feeling of meaninglessness that sort of ends up in uh, manifesting itself physically as ennui. So those of you who Fr speak French a little bit, ennui, um, defined this way, a listlessness or dissatisfaction that comes not from being occupied from, with anything that matters. In other words, it it's, comes out of doing things that are not part of uh, garden building. It's ironic that this is sometimes, you know, just lay around. It's a physical lethargy that is connected with physiological, spiritual, and emotional problems caused, not, uh, caused by not doing anything productive with energy and effort. Ennui, uh, a man may be experiencing, says our author, is directly related to what he's watching and doing and where he's putting his attention. <clears throat> In our culture, our culture of affluence, ennui is much more prevalent than it has been in the past. Um, we don't have to get up worrying that we have to protect, uh, that you have to protect our, your families from predators or in enemies and invaders, and we're not in some sort of military conflict where there's an active draft. You don't need to worry about spending hours hunting down something to feed your family. Um, there's uh, enough government money given out most of the time that men don't have to work in order for their children to be fed, and that for decades now, public assistance has stepped in where fathers once stood to make sure children get food. And I realize that's a complex issue that I've simplified down to, but uh, hopefully you can just take it like that. So what does this mean? We have lots of leisure time available to us. And uh, something similar happened. We talked about uh, an ex scientific experiment called Mouse Utopia, we, where we provided mice with everything that they would need in order to flourish in a society. And we found that for a while it worked, but after a while it didn't. The, um, the mice fell into um, some missing pages. And uh, anyhow, <clears throat> Here we are. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Here we go. Um, anyway, the short story is that our mice did one of two things. After a while, they're like, oh, I don't really have to work for this, so I'm going to form a gang and beat up on my other mice, or I'm going to sit in the corners and look beautiful. Both of those things are actually a symptom of this ennui, this lack of productive action in life. And today in America, many men are filled with ennui. What happened in the mouse colony? Everybody ended up dead. Is this where we're headed? Do we have too much free time, too much ennui filling ourselves? So let's look back at history. This isn't just some mouse utopia. This happened in Israel. During the time of King David, there was a high watermark in regard to the nation's wealth, military strength, and culture. David built up the kingdom uh, to a particular point with God's support. Okay, This isn't just David here. David then passes on this hard-fought success and stability to Solomon. Solomon begins his reign pretty well. He asks God for the wisdom. That was the first decision, right? Making a decision to be wise about our time and our efforts. And we see evidence of this wisdom in some of the Proverbs, like the one we just read. But Solomon grew up with leisure, and he was a king during a time of leisure and peace, and his life and capacity for leadership soon spiraled into the darkness of too many women, too many philosophies, too many enjoyments. And we see this recorded in First Kings. It should be First Kings uh, 11, so we're just going to move ahead from First Kings 3, which sort of describes the early part of Solomon's reign. Um, in 1 Kings 11, we see down in verse 3, he has 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. And the next slide says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So we can see that things are not going well for Solomon because he's just flitting away his time. And um, gentlemen, any number of wives more than one equals trouble, okay? So he had a lot of trouble. Uh, yeah, it's a very simple formula. All right. Um, so on King, C, uh, on King Solomon's watch, the nation suffers, 
And the seeds of division are sown in the kingdom, and by the end of his reign, the um, kingdom ends up split. Solomon also not only wrote the Proverbs when things were going well, but he also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which is sort of interesting. In the study Bible that I use quite a bit, I have three outlines, uh, headings for the outline that they give. And the outline headings are these. Um, the one section is the meaninglessness of life without God. The second section is examples of the futility of life without God. And number three, the uncertainty of life without God. This does not sound like a king who's got purpose in his life. He's laying around. There's no purpose in things. The common summary of the book is usually read here. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So when we are not pursuing purpose, God-given purpose, and we're spending our time on things that don't have any real value, we end up like this. King Solomon was full of ennui. Falling into ennui is not surprising. Um, and we can also see the symptoms of that today in our own life. People who are filled with ennui are easily aggravated, less patient, more judgmental, and they tend to be prone to jealousy and bitterness. These are just some things that psychologists have um, uh, revealed that uh, our author also brings up in his book. So I'd like you to remember that in order to avoid this ennui, remember these things. These are your purposes. Be a keeper of the garden, protect the vulnerable, be a voice of peace in the anxious world, and some other thing. And add value. And add value to the lives that are around you. I'm so sorry. Things yep, are. Right. We're figuring it out. Yep. Here. I got you. I think I'm over here. There you go. <laughs> I'm not sure what that. Let me have that page back. Is that six? Okay. That's five. That's five. I don't know. What's happened here? All right, we're going to figure it out. You're six. Okay, there we are. Whew. Too many pages here. All right, so uh, my job now is to kind of offer a little bit of a disclaimer here because uh, we often like um, there to be some immediate reward for having done the right thing, but doing the right thing as a man as we've been describing, does not always get you the recognition and praise that we tend to hunger for. Sorry, that's just the reality. Uh, now, if you do something stupid, you'll get noticed on social media, and people will play that little video clip 1.7 million times. Do something self-controlled, you won't get a, a, a single like. The strength of humility is not often celebrated. Here's another warning. Uh, relationships require bravery. Do you have to step in to the messiness of relationships? Now, with a show of hands, how many husbands have ever had to feel the question, honey, does this dress make, make me look fat? <laughs> have you ever had to do that? It's a very dangerous place to be. They're not I'm just raising warning their you. Hands that's right. <laughs> no, that's right. It's a very dangerous no, place. There's, there's a certain messiness that happens in the midst of relationships. And here's an example of that, the proverb, the wisdom of Proverbs. Here, I know that this is very complicated. There's a deep theological truth here, but bear with me. Where there is no oxen, the manger is clean. <laughs> yes, but the, from the abundant, the but abundant crops come from the strength of the ox. Uh, okay, so we're not really talking about barnyard animals here, but there is a deep truth here that we're trying to get at. Just like oxen were needed in that time to pull the plows and plant the fields and grow the food, um, if you want those sorts of good benefits, you're also going to have to deal with something else. The stuff that the oxen leaves in the stall, right, in the manger. It's a big, stinky mess. But where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, right? So if you want a clean uh, stall, you've got to get rid of the ox. But then if you get rid of the ox, you won't get a good harvest. There, you have to expect with a good harvest that there would be the mess of the oxen. Now, likewise, if you want to be in relationships that matter, that are productive, that are building up of others, that are kingdom-oriented, you need to expect that there will be some messiness. Because relationships among people, relationships among people are always mysterious, they're always complex, and there always is a certain risk. 
We can't, we can't know the future. God has not given us that ability to see. And we can't even really, I can't make my children do anything. I could never really even make the dog sit. And so uh, we don't have the kind of control that we want. Um, and so stepping into important relationships will mean that we are not in control. We are out of control. Now, we could instead decide to keep the manger clean, right? We, could, we can isolate and be passive. We can avoid the mess, the possible conflicts. But what's the cost of that? What is the cost of that? Well, we, we're not then pursuing kingdom relationships. And we find ourselves isolated and alone. We are made to have ambition for right relationships, to rise up and to try and to accept the risk of relationships. But we have to understand that there's some risk. We also need to try to understand what's happening in terms of ourselves. What are the ways in which we are wired up? Some of us are, are much more extroverted and much more talkative and much more outgoing. Some of us are more introverted and quiet and reserved. There's a certain way that each of our personalities are wired up. We have to recognize that. But we also have to recognize that for those of us who are more outgoing, we have to engage in these things with more care. And for those of us who are more introverted, we're going to have to step beyond our natural wiring. Most people are starved for the encouragement of right relationships. I can, I, I'm in a relationship with a, a new person right now who is starved for human interaction, starved. And we need to be able to speak what God would intend to those people who are starved for encouragement. Lots of encouraging, freeing things will go unsaid if you don't say them. And so being who we need to be takes the guts of kingdom ambition. It needs to take the, the, the guts of right risks for the kingdom's sake. So men, we need to be the men of right ambition for godly relationships. We need to step into the mess, step into the chaos, step into the mystery, and knowing that the Lord is with us. And, you know, let's see what happens, right? Let's see what happens. Most men uh, get married. Now, this is, uh, of course, what I was alluding to before. And, and marriage is, a, is an interesting relationship because there's no person who will, no human being who will know you as well as your spouse. There will, there will be no person in your life other than your spouse who will be able to sniff out your lies and to smell the places where you're twisting the truth and to sense it, you know, without even a word being said. Our spouses are that close to us. And so there's, uh, we have to understand that this person who will know the worst of us and the best, but who will know us most intimately, that person is the one who needs you to be most ambitious. She is the one who needs you to be most ambitious. Though this will not involve um, wisdom in the way we talked about a book knowledge or being a multimillionaire, it does not mean that you need to be independently wealthy and you need to provide for every single person uh, on the planet. Instead, a wife wants her husband to have the drive to get things done. Productive things, keeper of garden things, protective things, real life things. And ironically, spending too much money, too much time at work, making too much money, uh, working all the time will not make her feel more secure. And so this godly ambition that we're talking about has to be rightly ordered. And here's a couple of questions that you might think about for yourself. Does my actions make her feel more secure or less secure? Do my actions communicate my commitment to her and for the kids as well, for their well-being and for their protection? Does she sense that I am engaged in real life and ready to do what that real life requires? Now, how to be awesome and yet somehow less attractive. How do you do that? Well, you take undue risks. That might look awesome, but you will not be more attractive if you're, if you're you know, uh, bungee jumping and skydiving and doing those things when you should have been picking up the kids from the soccer game kind of a thing. You get the idea of what I'm trying to say there. Uh, as a single man, she might have thought that you were brave and courage, but as a married man, not so much. Pointless risks are just a rush for the immature. 
But taking risks to protect the vulnerable, that's what's important. All right, so if that's true, and ladies, is it true that we like our men to be productive and do things for the good of the family? Of course it is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, no husband was ever shot while doing the dishes. That's correct. <laughs> let's, think, let's think about your work then. You know, is your work, whatever your job is, what is the purpose of your work? Your work is about service. Uh, Whatever you are doing, you are a servant. Serving people is ennobling. I don't care if you are the president of the company, look for opportunities to serve the people that work for you. Um, if you're in a neighbor neighborhood, find ways to serve your neighbors, serve your wife, serve your children. Work, in all of its forms, is a good thing. And part of the garden's uh, design from the very beginning of time has been good work. God said, go into the garden, till it, and keep it. Colossians just reminds us of this. Don't have it? You'll have to remind. You can look it up. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. Make a note. Uh, what we do know is, there we go, that when we are ambitious about the right things, that includes an ambition for service. American culture, on the other hand, values wealth, not necessarily service. So we are constantly in conflict with that. We're taught directly and indirectly to seek to possess everything we desire. Lots of advertisements on TV, you gotta have it, gotta do it, whatever. The problem is that there's always a newer version. Okay, how many of you have ever bought something new and the next week the next model came out? Okay, <laughs> it is not about having the next thing. Okay, uh, it's about contentment within this service culture, well, so that we want, right? God is saying be a servant and be content Discontentment is the problem. If you saw, you bought that brand new boat and next week or next year the next model came out and now you're mad, somehow your boat isn't good enough anymore, it's about discontentment. Discontentment breeds dependency. Unless I have model X5000, I'm not going to be happy. A godly man learns to discipline his desires so that he, has, he can say, I don't need model x5000. The biblical guidance for this is way back in the Ten Commandments. Take a look at Exodus 20. Okay, Exodus 20 says, don't covet anything your neighbor has, his wife, or his oxen, or anything that is his. Be content, because contentment brings freedom. In the Tenth Commandment, God wraps up all the other commandments by saying, if you obey these things, you will lack nothing. So God knows the things of our heart. He knows what we need. He knows what makes us the best versions of ourselves. And guys, this is true, especially for you as keepers of the garden. The key is being ambitious about the right things. So don't believe all the advertising you see. And now advertising is everywhere, on the road, on TV, on the internet, on your phone. You can't escape it. But you'd be surprised, and maybe you figured this out already, you'd be surprised at how little you actually need to be content how much you can actually put up with, right, not having X5,000. Contentment is a real thing. The 23rd Psalm is the best reminder for me to remember to be content. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, right? In other words, he will make sure that I have what I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Even in suffering, Paul says in the New Testament, there can still be contentment. He spends some time talking about a thorn in his side that the Lord is not removing, and yet I'm content in all things. This is possible, and in fact, it's the best option for us. Another feature of this godly ambition for the right things is the ambition for humility. Uh, another thing of our culture, win. If you're not the winner, you're nothing. And it was interesting that uh, I found some, I'm going to show you some pictures here about the options of that. That didn't happen either? Nope. All right. So, I'm not ambitious about the slides. I'm not ambitious about the right things. 
Uh, competition is a great thing. I happen to be very competitive myself, um, and it's not always a good feature of mine, but competition is something that our culture values. Think about the Olympics, for example. The Olympics, you get up there, you strive, you spend years and years preparing, and then there's a gold medal, a silver medal, and a bronze medalist. There's actually a phenomenon now that has been named as the silver medal face. The gold medalist is like, who oh, would? And the bronze medalist is like, I made it to the podium. And the silver medalist is like, I'm number one of all the losers. Right? Is it really about winning in the way that the world suggests? It's not. In fact, in our book, Brant Hansen says, let's be ambitious about losing. Um, Right, so he says, losing in style and grace is a symbol of maturity and people admire it. So rather than having the silver medal face, which is usually like this, we can face defeat with style and grace because our value is not about the color of the medal. Our value is, comes from something much more eternal and permanent. Your value is separate from the games the world plays. Thank God for that. Winning and losing are just words, and the ambition can be better applied not to getting the gold medal, but to real relationships and real people. So the best ambition is to become a man who is so secure, so sure of what his creator thinks of him, that he knows he's winning regardless of the score in the game. Even when you're losing, you are a man of value, made for godly purposes in the garden in which he inhabits. In the Beatitudes, the Lord says this, reminds us of this strange dichotomy between the world and what the Lord offers. Blessed are you who mourn, for you'll be comforted. Blessed are you when others speak evil about you. Are you losing the social media game because you dare to speak up about Jesus? Blessed are you when people revile you. Right? It's yours is the kingdom of heaven. You will be brought to the brought to the table in heaven. The best example of this godly ambition in the midst of losing the way the, Lord, the world would define it is Jesus. Jesus was planned to be a Messiah by other men as the one who comes in victory, rides into Jerusalem on his horse. He rides in on a donkey, gets crucified a week later, less than a week later. To a lot of people, that was losing. But what did he do? He had the victory over death. So this is our model, men. This is your model, men. We want to have ambition for the humility that allows you to be losers because your value is in Jesus. One more. Part of our, your ambition is also for the ambition of contentment. I'm sorry, commitment. Um, thinking about, do we have this one? Nope. I looked it up. Pringles has 34 flavors. 34 flavors of Pringles. Uh, we like to keep our options open, Americans. Um, we need the variety. We need the variety somehow. Why settle for just three flavors? We can have 34 flavors of Pringles. Is this working for relationships, too? Uh, I want you to consider this scenario. Like, I like you. Let's live together. It'll be fun. It'll look a lot like marriage, but we might even get some pets and maybe a house, even kids. But if I find someone I like better, um, it'll be a lot easier to leave you if I don't really have any legal ties to everything we've built together. Is that keeping your options open? Does this sound like something you'd want? Someone who just leaves you if they find something better this week? Being committed to something or someone means making choices that cut off other options. Brant Hansen defines this as embracing your limits. And we know in scripture this tension between what the world would tell you and what the Lord would tell you is always there. Being commitment, uh, having ambition for commitment means um, having limits to allow you to fully focus on what you've chosen to do and what you've committed to. And the outcome of this ambition is fruitful, long-lasting relationship. Okay, thank you for uh, going through a very long sermon today. I know that uh, I'm hungry, and we're going to move on. So...
Uh, here's what we got for today. Uh, being a man means having the right ambition that would require us to have wisdom, God wisdom, applying God's truth accurately in our own lives so that we might share it to bless others. It means having courage to step into the meaningful risks that cultivate growth towards spiritual and relational maturity. So we need to have courage in relationships. Purposeful service. Do real things for real people and do them really well. Humility. Lose like a grown-up. Contentment. To prioritize God relationships. Uh, God and relationships. It's going to require sacrifice. And it'll require also the sacrifice of the experiences that we really want to take up our time. And we need a commitment to embrace the limits of our time and choose to focus on the things of real relational depth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for today and for this, uh, these things that challenge us, uh, challenge me. Uh, help me, Lord, to be the man that you've made me to be, uh, to be the keeper of the gardens that you've called me to tend. I pray that for all the men here in the room. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're going to sing a song. Our final hymn is Be Thou My Vision. If you'd like to read the music, it's number 339. I'm really hoping that we have some slides You'll for You'll look it. at 339 in the hymnal, on, and if nope, you would I, also please uh, sing the first and last verse. All right, here we go. <clears throat> third verse together third verse so there we go be thou my wisdom and thou my truth Oh, that was an adventure. Not all enough, right. Not enough ambition for practice. Yes. Either. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, please be seated for just one moment. Uh, quick announcements. Uh, tomorrow night would be our normal ministry teams meeting. So if you are a regular attender of one of our ministry teams or participants, please see me after worship just to confirm that you can be there tomorrow night so that we might know how to schedule. Today is Soup for Souls. And so thank you for those of you who cooked soup. Uh, Barry and others will have a table set up out there uh, with, there'll be a couple with uh, names on them already, so you might look for those if you'd be interested in, in delivering one or two to those to some particular people, that would be awesome. Otherwise, uh, pick a neighbor or pick a person you know who's maybe been sick or so on, and uh, let's get those soups out there. Uh, there's some brochures uh, in the reception area. I'd like you to pick up one or two of those as well to bring with your soup, particularly if it's uh, a person who's not familiar with our congregation. Uh, all of our uh, regular discipleship and education things are happening this week, journey groups, discipleship groups, and precept Bible study. Uh, I don't Anything else for the good of the order today? Please bow your head. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you, Lord, that as we wrestle with these uh, things that you call men to do and be, that you would wrestle us specifically, uh, and not just uh, the idea of such things, but the reality of such things. So be with us now. Bless these people, Lord, as they go out into the world from this place. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.